Yeah, I could do that. Artificial life. If you don't know what that is, then just think normal life, but not real. But how is that done? Well, the most common way that people try and do this is by having an environment populated by lots of creatures and some sort of food for them to eat. But having just that is boring, so you need the creatures to be able to move and think about how to move, you know, just if food left, turn left, etc. But that is still boring. So the part that makes it interesting is that the creatures can have children that are just ever so slightly mutated, rinse and repeat, and the weak die, and the strong live. And now those boring creatures can evolve. So let's make that. Okay, uh, black screen, and boom, a black screen, but with lines. But what do those mean? Well, remember how I said that the creatures would need to first learn? Well, it's going to be from the power of neural networks. And specifically, it's going to be through a type called NEAT, which stands for Neuroevolution of Augmenting Topologies, which is sort of made for this kind of thing. A NEAT network will be made of nodes and connections that stretch between them. Every node will have a value of 1 to minus 1. And what the connections do is take that value, multiply it by some number, which is called a weight, and give it to the next node. Rinse and repeat for a few million times, and boom, you now have a brain. But I sadly don't have access to any kind of supercomputer, so I'll have to stick with tens and not millions of connections. But the thing with neat that makes it pretty neat is the augmenting topologies part, as it means that the network isn't stuck in the same boring shape, and the connections can not only change their weight, but also completely change the nodes they're connected to, and even grow new connections. Why is that important? Well, it means that the brain can physically change its shape to become really optimized at doing one thing, which in this case is not dying. The nodes and connections are then set up into three different layers. Those on the very left make up the input layer. Uh, these nodes are set according to different things outside of the network, like for example, the current position, rotation, how much energy a creature has left, etc. The nodes on the very right make up the output layer and tell the creature what to do like move forward, eat, or spin around. In between is the most important layer, the hidden layer, which is what processes the input and decides what the output should be. When muted correctly, it can, for example, make a creature turn towards food, or turn away from other creatures. The bigger the input layer, the more different inputs you can have, the bigger the output layer, and the more different things a creature can do. And the bigger the hidden layer, the more thought can be put into its actions. Okay, let's continue. Finally gave the brain a body, Oh, no way, it's turning. Okay, so it's, the brain's telling it to go forwards, so it's going forwards. So. No way, it's turning again. Okay, uh, added some green food pellets. Okay, now it should turn. Oh, wait. Okay, maybe that was just bad. No. Okay, now it should work. Much better. You know, it's turning to the food instead of doing whatever it was doing before. Ray casting. That will sure not get scrapped. Finally added mutations. Uh, everything works, it's just that every time it's mutated, it's just that all the wiring in its head just becomes so scrambled that it can't move at all, or do anything really. Well anyways, now there's two of them. Oh, and if you look in the corner, uh, that's the creature's neural network, and that little bit of red means that the creature can see the other creature. Now they can lay eggs. And it hit the creature limit. And now, let's see the creatures finally evolve on the time lapse. Yeah, okay, th that was boring. Right now, all that changes with creatures is their brain. Which is nice, but you can't really see that happen. Unless you get really unlucky and mutate so they can't even move anymore. That's much better. They can now be different colours and they don't look like plain boxes anymore. And instead some sort of weird tadpole looking thing. Oh and I uh, also added one, well three more things. Varying sight, speed and size. Uh, uh, these three traits will let the creatures sort of specialise into different species that are different from one another. So sight is just the max distance that they can see food and other creatures from, speed is how fast they can move and turn, 
and size controls, well, size, but also many other small things like the max health and energy a creature can have. All of these, as useful as they are, do have a cost though, as the effective amount of energy that you need to survive. So, for example, if you're going to be really quick, you're going to need to have a lot of energy to survive, uh, as you're going to burn through a lot of it. So, to compensate, you're going to need to be slow, as that will help decrease the amount of energy used, uh, with the same applying to the size and sight. After running the simulation, I noticed one thing. It is so slow. Here it is running later on with a few hundred creatures, you know, sandpaper smooth. And this is a very big problem, as almost always, there's going to be so many creatures that my PC goes from frames per second to seconds per frame. So how do you fix this? Well, one idea is that you can throw more power at it, you know, because right now the program is limited to just one thread, which means it can only do one thing at a time. But what if it could do more, you know? If you're not stuck with one thread, you can, you know, do more things at a time, you know? If you have two threads, you can do things twice as quick, three, triple, four, you get what I mean. But this is not the fix. Why? Because it can't be used for everything, as some things just have to be done one at a time. Even simple things like adding a one to a number twice, you know, with one thread, it's easy, don't need to worry about anything. One plus one is two. But with two or more threads, you get problems as you're gonna, you might get one instead of two. This is because when you have multiple threads you really need to make sure that they don't write to the same data otherwise you can get problems as one thread could be reading one piece of data while another thread is also trying to write to that same piece of data. So multi-threading doesn't really fix the problem and instead just pushes it away to be solved later which I don't want to do I want to fix it now. So how do you fix the performance issue? Well, the root cause is that the program makes so many pointless checks. For example, let's say we have a creature in a simulation surrounded in food pellets that has a certain range it can see stuff in. How do we find the nearest food pellet it can see? Now, the obvious answer is just check them all. But that is very slow and inefficient, because you're going to need to do that for every single creature and food pellet. And when there's thousands of pellets and thousands of creatures, you can get millions of checks per frame, with a majority of them just being completely pointless to check, as they're not even in its range, but they are still checked. But how do you know if a pellet is pointless to check without checking? Well, you first need to divide up the world into a grid, and each grid square can then store a pointer to every pellet that's inside it. So what the creature needs to do, instead of checking every single pellet, it can only just check for nearby grids, and because each grid square stores a pointer to the pellets that are inside, it can just look for those pellets inside those squares. By only checking those pellets, they're guaranteed to be in or at least somewhat near its range. And this isn't just limited to food pellets, you can expand this to checking other creatures as well. Here's how it runs now, much smoother. There's still a bit of lag, but a majority of it is just gone. Oh, and let's see the creatures evolve with all this well, new stuff I've added. And this time, I'm going to make them start off the bare minimum. As in the last time lapse, I started the creatures off with a brain that lets them turn to food, which is kind of cheating. But this time, I want to see if the creatures can evolve all that by themselves. So all the starting creatures will have completely random genetics, well, except that I did set up the brain so that they can move forwards, eat and lay eggs. But if I didn't do that, they would die 100% of the time. So, you know, I had to give them a chance at least. So with that all said, let the time lapse begin. So the creatures evolved, but like always, there is a problem. 
For most of the creatures, the brain did evolve, but in a way that it stayed pretty much the same in functionality, as all that rarely changed for most is slightly different ways and new connections that didn't really change what the creature did. But the interesting thing is how their body evolved, as it evolved to be small and fast, because that when you're small, it costs less energy to lay an egg, so you can lay more eggs for every pellet you eat. But the really interesting thing is that, because their brain didn't evolve to look for anything, its sight range dropped to conserve energy, as why waste energy trying to look if you're not even going to end up using that information? So for most creatures, their plan ended up being move forward until you hit a pellet and then just lay an egg. Which isn't great because they just end up going right past food parts and missing them because their brains didn't evolve to turn to the pellets. And this is happening because the way I set up the neural network is that for a creature to create one, you just need to supply it with the different connections, which just stores the start node, end node, and the weight. And from that, it'll just figure out the rest. But the problem comes when mutating the network, because when coding up the neural network, I got a bit lazy when it came to creating how the connections would get mutated, as what I did is just when the network needs to mutate, it just copies all the connections, takes the three values that they store, and represent them in binary, and then afterwards just randomly flips some bits hoping for the best, then convert them back into connections and then into a network. The problem with that is that this usually forms invalid connections, like ones that go into an input node, come from or go to a non-existent node, and ones that go into themselves. And an invalid connection is a useless connection, as it does nothing, because it can't do anything. And the very nice thing is that useful connections would mutate into these invalid connections, and a creature would then be born not knowing how to move, lay eggs, or eat, and I don't think I need to explain why that's not good. So what is the solution? Well, remember how I said that the network is a neat network? Well, it turns out that the guys who designed this also designed a way that a neat network would evolve. So instead of just continuing to be lazy, I decided to just make the network it was intended to be. So now the connections can mutate in four distinct ways. A specific connection can have its weight change, a connection can be removed, a connection can be added, or the connection could be split in two with a node in between. With this, the amount of invalid connections made should be much lower and the brain should start to actually evolve. Now let's do another time lapse with the new mutations and another little tweak. Because right now, the total number of food pellets stays constant as when one's eaten, another is made. But there is a problem with this. Here's a simulation that has 800 pellets that I left running for 5 minutes, but the creatures couldn't evolve. A little over 500 at the end. Now, here is another simulation, but they can evolve all the same settings. Sir. And now I have over a thousand creatures, even though the total number of pellets didn't change. This is happening because the creatures evolved to get better at surviving, so they can do more with the pellets that they have, and the population just grows so out of control that my PC just melts. To fix this, I made it so the total number of food pellets is tied to the total number of creatures, so that if there are more creatures, the total number of pellets drop to stop the population from growing any further, and when they start dying out, there are more pellets to save them from that. This also has the effect of purging any inefficient creatures, as at the start, when there's lots of food, you can get away with pretty much anything, as you are bound to hit a pellet at some point. But later on, when the population grows and there's less food, those tactics won't work anymore, and you'll be relying on mostly luck, which doesn't matter if the competition is both stronger and smarter. With only the best of the best surviving, this should help speed up the process of evolution. So let's finally start the time lapse. Thank you.
After so much time put into this, they finally evolved. I also added that the simulation would also return some data to be graphed, specifically the population, average site speed, and size. You can see that the population first spikes up to just under 700 as the simulation starts off with a high amount of pellets, but then later on when they eat them all, no more spawn as there's too many creatures, and the population begins to drop back down and then they level out at about 200 with the occasional dip to 100 but it always goes back up at the end. One interesting thing is that the size of the creatures didn't really change that much, which means that this graph is actually pretty misleading as its scale is really small making the small changes look bigger than they actually are. The creature's sight at first doesn't change by much, but then later on spikes up and averages about to about 1.5. Though the speed for some reason starts to drop off down a fair bit, before then going back to what it originally was, then climbs back up and stays at around 1.7. So over time the creatures didn't really change in size that much, probably because being smaller means that you store less energy, which you definitely don't want in the later parts of the simulation when there's barely any food to get energy from and because being any bigger would mean you burn through more energy, which is equally as bad. Even though their size didn't change by much, their sight and speed did to make them see food from further away and to get there before any other creature could. Another thing also did happen, as if you look closely at the graph, you can see data going all the way up to 500,000, but the time lapse only went up to 150,000. That's because I stopped recording, because I wanted to leave the simulation running for a bit longer in the background, just to see what would happen. They did evolve to not only turn to food, but when there isn't any food nearby, they slow down or even stop moving, which is something I didn't expect to happen. And I'm guessing that is because they evolved this because A, it's pointless to move when there's no food, and B, it's pointless to look for food outside your view, as chances are another creature will get to it first. With that all done, now what? Well, I have a few plans. I want to first make the UI more polished, as right now it just looks bad and is annoying to use. And I'll maybe add some new features like a tree view that shows every creature's children and parent, so you can see how different creatures are related. I'm not that happy with the AI that the creatures have right now, as it can take them forever to learn some actions. Them moving only when there is food took a very long time to happen, so I might look into different ways of teaching a network and might even try using reinforcement learning, but that is if it is better than what I have right now. Uh, predation is a big one that I want, uh, because in the Bibix project, which is a big inspiration for this, you can have creatures directly compete with each other, and a sort of arms race happens as the predators and herbivores try and become better than the other to survive. Right now, none of this is happening, which makes the simulation pretty boring after the population levels out. So from there, it stays pretty much the same as there's now nothing else pushing the creatures to evolve. Evolving bodies is another goal I want to reach, as I want them to be able to evolve new limbs and new ways of moving them to swim faster, instead of just moving the speed slider up. It should also make it more interesting to look at, as you would clearly see that they're different creatures instead of just the same creature with a different colour or a different size. Later on, I want to see the plants can also evolve, but I think I'll do that by trying to make the plants and creatures technically be the same thing but they either specialise into getting energy from sunlight or getting energy from eating other creatures. A good example is the life engine, as in that everything starts off as a plan, but then through a series of mutations, they begin to move and eat each other until they are clearly either a plant or an animal, but that will probably be a long term goal as that will take a while to do. So that's my rough to-do list, uh, if you have any ideas feel free to mention them as I'm open to any additions that could be made. The whole project is open source on GitHub, and there'll be a link to it in the description. Subscribe so you know if I post an update, and see you in the next video hopefully.